So Yom Kippur is Day of Atonement. Yom Kippurim is Day of Atonements. So why would they literally call it Day of Atonements in the plural? Well, you're going to see that on your notes. In Leviticus 16, verse 33, uh, talking about the high priest here, it says, and he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary. And he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the t congregation and for the altar. And he shall make an atonement for the priests and for all the people of the congregation. So you can see that he was making several atonements. Now, when you think of atonement, what do you think of? Atoning for what? Did the sanctuary or the tabernacle, the altar commit a sin? Well, what is, it, what is it talking about? And how is Passover different from Yom Kippur? Passover is in the first month. Yom Kippur is in the seventh month. What is the difference between Passover and Yom Kippur? So uh, we're going to look at some of these things. But the interesting thing is uh, it's not only just sin but uncleanness. And uh, they couldn't just scrub the altar down with water. If something's not clean, we think get some soap and clean it or something but no it took blood on top of all the other blood that had been shed it was only on this day and it took special blood i mean even though they had killed goats all along here they're killing rams and bulls and a couple of goats you know and different things but it was only on that day that, that those particular the, the red heifer could have, was done continuously and it was sacrificed on the mount of olives which is across from the temple. If you look at the eastern gate, uh, it faces the Mount of Olives. There actually was a bridge there in Christ's time. And over there is where they killed the ashes, where they killed the red heifer. And the ashes of the red heifer uh, was not necessarily for sin as much as it was to make you clean if you had become unclean. Let's say you had walked over a grave, a dead body. That's not a sin to walk over a dead body, but you can't go in the temple if you just walked over a dead body. So you have to have the ashes of the red heifer put upon you. Now, in Leviticus 16, 6 through 10. Now, first off, notice it was the Yom Kippur was for the sanctuary, the tabernacle, the altar, for the priests, and for all the people of the congregation. And then in verse uh, 16, 6 through 10, it talks about how Aaron shall offer a bullock of the sin offering, which is for who? It's for himself only. And make atonement for himself and for what? Yeah. That's right, his family. And then it says, He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats. One lot is for the Lord and the other lot is for the scapegoat. Have you guys heard of that before? Now do you kind of bring back memory of Yom Kippur? They have the two goats. Uh, in Hebrew, the scapegoat is the Azazel. And uh, ez is the Hebrew word for goat, and azel means uh, to uh, go away, disappear. And so azazel is the goat that goes away. One of them is going to be sacrificed. The other one is taken about 10 miles away, right, taken out into the wilderness. And we're going to look at those things. And, and then it says this, And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. So the scapegoat is to make an atonement with him. Now, some people, and I, I think it's completely wrong, think that the Azazel of the scapegoat is representative of Satan. It is not. Because how can Satan make an atonement? The Azazel is the Lord taking our sins away. And we're going to look at, you're going to see that more. And it talked about the, the lot for the Lord and the lot for the scapegoat. Uh, we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but there was two lots, right? If the lot fell for the Lord in the right hand, the goat for the Lord, if that lot fell in the right hand, that was a good sign. Okay? And the one for the scapegoat, you know, should be in the left hand. So that's basically what how they kind of felt like things are going to go good if that lot would fall in the right hand. Now, anyway, when is Yom Kippur? We see in Leviticus 23, it's on the 10th day of the seventh month. There shall be a day of atonement, and it shall be a holy convocation. And what do you remember the word convocation means? It's like a rehearsal. 
to you, and you shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. This was the most solemn day of the year because of that verse. This, is, this was one solemn day. Uh, in 2332, it goes on to say, It shall be a Sabbath of rest to you, and you shall, again it says, afflict your souls. But look at when it says to begin, the ninth day of the month at even, because remember their day started at sunset. So at beginning at the ninth day of the month at even, from even to even, shall you celebrate your Sabbath. Now this, uh, what's nice when you understand this was the fast day. They even called it the fast. Everyone, like if, when I said, hey, we're going to get together on Turkey Day, you know that's Thanksgiving. Okay, when they refer to the fast, everyone knows it's what? Yom Kippur. And you see that in Acts chapter 27, verse 9. If you wouldn't realize they were talking about Yom Kippur unless you knew this. It says, now when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed, he's letting them know, hey, it's late in the year. This, look what time of the year it is. Okay, and the, the storms get worse and the rains get worse. Well, that particular verse, if you didn't realize that, you didn't know that was the day of Yom Kippur, did you? So this is why uh, we like to teach Hebrew roots because all of a sudden it makes connecting the dots easier in your Bible. Now, what happened, if you remember, what happened the first Passover? That's when they put the blood on the doorpost and the angel of death came and then they all crossed the Red Sea, right? And then uh, what happened at the first Pentecost? That was when Moses received the Torah on Mount Sinai. A couple months later, in the third month, Moses went up for 40 days, and, and then he came back down, and there was a problem, wasn't there? What was it? The golden calf. So what did he do? He went back up for how long? Another 40 days. Well, so what happened on the first Yom Kippur? Okay, we know that the first Passover, they left Egypt. The first Feast of Pentecost, they received the Torah. The first Yom Kippur... Let's take a look at Exodus 32, verse 30. Here it says, It came to pass on the morrow that Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to the Lord for adventure. I shall do what? Make an atonement for you, for your sin. And so Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now if you will forgive their sin, and you see a little hyphen there. You'll see it in your Bible as well as on the notes. That's the only place in the whole Bible where that hyphen is. And it's like he's taking a, a pause and he's thinking about this and he says this sin is too great in his own mind. He's saying there's no way God could forgive this sin. They just were told not to do it. And now they've done it. <clears throat> and so look what Moses says. And how many of us would be willing to do what Moses just said? He says, if you can't forgive their sin, God, blot me, I pray thee, out of the book of life. Would you be willing to be blotted out of the book of life, let alone for a righteous person? How about a bunch of rebellious people? And it says, and the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against him, uh, against me, him will I blot out of my book. Uh, Elul 1 was uh, approximately 40 days ago. Okay, the, uh, it goes from the month of Elul to the month of Tishri, just like we have September and October. So uh, for English sake, to make sense, let's think uh, trumpets, I mean, atonement is on October 10th. September 1st would be equivalent of Elul 1. That began the 40 days on Elul 1 or September 1st that Moses went up the second 40 days. So he came down on the 10th day of Tishri. So for 40 days, they're all scared to death. Is God going to forgive us? Did we blow it? And that's why the whole, every year, the month of Elul, those 40 days are known as the 40 days of uh, Teshuvah, repentance. When uh, it's, you know... It's good to take the practical aspects of the Bible and make them practical. And so that's why every year, uh, remember that and use it as a time for introspection and to look. And so Moses literally came down letting the people know atonement was achieved on the Day of Atonement. It was on Yom Kippur. That, the first Yom Kippur was them realizing the 40th day Moses came down that everything was cool. Okay, God had forgiven them. So that was the first day of atonement. Now, uh, in Exodus 34, at the top of page 2, verse 29 and 30, is where it talks about how Moses, when he came down from Mount Sinai, remember he had the two tables of testimony in his hand and his face shone real bright because he had just spent time face to face with God, didn't he? That's why the day of atonement is known, another idiom is face to face. 
Because how many times a year could the high priest go into the Holy of Holies? And when was that? On the Day of Atonement. Now, what's interesting is the Day of Atonement is on the 10th day of the month of Tishri. So the first Day of Atonement, he's come down, and now they know they've been atoned for. The next feast we're going to be talking about next week is the Feast of Tabernacles. So what happened on the first Feast of Tabernacles? Well, let's go back. Look at Exodus 35. What happened when Moses was up there for 40 days? When Moses comes back down, he speaks to the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it, an offering of the Lord, gold, silver, brass, blue, purple, scarlet, fine linen, goat's hair, ramskin, dyes red, badger skins, and shittim wood. So for the next five days, they were gathering everything together, and so what happens? Look at Leviticus 23, 39 and 40. It says, also in the 15th day of the seventh month, when you've gathered in the fruit of your land, you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. And you may wonder, how can you have eight days and seven, right? We're going to talk about that next week. And then it says, and you shall take you on the first days bows of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, bows of thick trees, willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. It was the Feast of Tabernacles. So on the first Feast of Tabernacles, they begin to build the tabernacle. They literally, on the Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement, he comes down, the first one, and says, guess what? Atonement's been made, and God wants to now live with you. God wants to go camping with you guys. So he says, now let's get everything together and we're going to build a tent for God, a tabernacle for God. And so they're rejoicing. They've been redeemed and God now wants to come and live with us. And so the first feast of tabernacles, they are building the tabernacle. Doesn't that make sense? Good reason to celebrate. So uh, the, a lot of people, they seem to have a page in the middle of the New Testament and the Old Testament. They don't realize it's one book and you could rip that page out. People think, well, the Old Testament is law, the New Testament is grace. No, grace was all through the Old Testament. And the Day of Atonement was literally a gracious day every year when all the Israelites could experience a new beginning. Because that day their sins were atoned for. So they could experience a new beginning. This day, what the Day of Atonement foreshadows prophetically, is God's plan for the final disposition of sin and the creation of a new earth where righteousness dwells. That's what it's all about. Uh, 2 Peter 3.13, it says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, we look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And so God wants righteousness to dwell. And so how many of us believe in being born again or a new birth, a new beginning? That's what they would go through, that whole concept, every year on the Day of Atonement. Is the whole idea of new beginnings, being able to start over. Now, the word atonement in Hebrew means is uh, kafar, and uh, it means to cover. But think of it in terms of a credit card like I have up there. Your credit card just covers you until you can make the payment. The credit card isn't the payment. The credit card covers you until you finally make the payment. The day of atonement was just the cover charge until atonement could be made. And it's like sometimes when we clean our room, we just throw everything under the covers. So there's one thing to clean your room and shove everything under the covers. So during Yom Kippur, all it was doing was really covering our sins. Our sins are still under the bed. Until Messiah came. Uh, what does John 1.29 say? It says, the next day John sees Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which does what? Takes away the sin of the world. So the entire first covenant was just a matter of covering sins. So they wouldn't be seen. They're under the covers. Or think of it in terms of a credit card where it's just being covered until the real expense, the payment is made down the road. Uh, that's why in Psalms 103, uh, 12, it says, As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgression from us. He's removed it. He's not just covered it. That's the difference. Uh, in Micah 7.19, it says, He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. Thou will cast all their sins into what? 
the depths of the sea. Not only are they going to be removed, they're going to be what? I mean, oh, I forgive you, but I'll never forget. You hear that before? God says, I'm going to forget, so for heaven's sake, quit reminding me of it. How important is blood in the Bible? Top of page 3. I just have the scripture references. You can look up yourself, but it's, blood is the token of the new covenant. It's the blood that gives eternal life, that brings redemption, that makes atonement, that justifies us before God, that gives us forgiveness, that provides reconciliation, provides cleansing, enables us to be overcomers. We overcome by the blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony. And we were purchased with this blood. So you can see how important blood is, especially on the day of atonement. Uh, in Job 9, verse 30 through 33, Job says, If I wash myself with snow water, well, that's cold, and make my hands never so clean, yet you shall plunge me in the ditch, and my own clothes shall abhor me. For God, or he is not a man as I am, that I should answer him. And we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any day's man betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both. In other words, he's saying, if, if I offend you, then another person, a judge, can come. But if I offend God, who was there to mediate between God and man? That's why Eli says to Hophni and Phinehas in 1 Samuel 2, he says, Nay, my sons, it is no good report I hear. You make the Lord's people to transgress, and if one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who is there that's going to entreat for him? Uh, and this is important verses to realize why Jesus is God. A lot of people out there don't think Jesus was God. He was just a good man. But he had to be both divine and human to be that mediator between the two. As a matter of fact, in Psalms 49, 15, it says, God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. And in Galatians 3, 13, it says, Christ has redeemed us. Psalms 49, it says this, They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him, for the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceases forever. So you can see all that money on the screen there, but it's not going to help, is it? If you sinned against the... I mean, it just doesn't work. I mean, if a police stops me for a speeding ticket, and I say, yeah, but I dumped the trash for my mom... He doesn't care. It doesn't matter how much good you've done or how many times you haven't sped, okay? And it doesn't, I don't care how much money, no way can money redeem a soul from the power of the grave, can it? It can't. But God will redeem my soul, okay? So not money, only God can redeem our soul. And then in Galatians 3.13, it says Christ has redeemed us. You see on this picture here, the atonement brought forgiveness. Now, is salvation free? But does it come at a great cost? It's free to you. Just like if you give your kid a car, it's free to them. But it cost you something, didn't it? Sometimes we don't realize how costly salvation really was. In Hebrews 10, 4 through 6, it says it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should do what? They can cover sins, but they can't take away sins. Uh, so what we discover about the Feast of Yom Kippur... This was the day when the nation of Israel was to be atoned for. Passover speaks of individual redemption. Think of it this way. Pa the difference between Passover and Yom Kippur and the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Passover was for individual redemption. But the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles speaks of national redemption. God says every knee shall bow and every tongue confess, right? And that's individuals are doing it voluntarily as results of Passover. Come Yom Kippur and Tabernacles, every government, whether they like it or not, are going to bow to the knee of the Lord. So the fall feast speaks of national redemptions, and the feast of Yom Kippur in particular, particular speaks of the nation of Israel only. If you remember, it doesn't talk anything about the Gentile nations. They were for the high priest, for his family, for the tabernacle, for the congregation of the people that were there. Now, one of the things that happened, the high priest would always take off uh, the royal garments. How many of you have heard about the high priest and the breastplate and all of that kind of thing? On Yom Kippur, though, actually, he would take a bath five times. He'd go back and forth between his royal garments and the linen garments. He'd wash his hands and feet ten times. He'd take off his clothes and wash himself five times, go back and forth between the clothes. 
But the significant thing of Yom Kippur is the white linen garments that he would have on. And what does white linen speak of? Righteousness, exactly. But can you imagine having on all white linen garments and you're doing all these bloody sacrifices and blood is going everywhere? What's going to happen to your nice white linen garments? Yeah, I mean, he would be taking, uh, you're going to read how he put the finger uh, his, in the blood, and he'd be taking it and he'd be in a whipping motion like a cracked whip, and he would go down seven times as he's sprinkling the blood. And, I mean, blood, is, he's slaughtering everything, it's just going everywhere on his white linen garments. Well, you're going to see some pictures here. I'm presenting, you're going to, I'm laying a foundation here, and you're going to begin to see in Revelations. How many of you have read the book of Revelations? Okay, I tell you what, you do not understand prophecy, you do not understand the book of Revelation until you understand the fall festivals. And you're going to see them. How many of you have heard of trumpets in the book of Revelation? Feast of trumpets, ring a bell? You're going to see the a Yom Kippur service in the book of Revelation. And then you're going to see the Feast of Tabernacles, where God tabernacles among men and begins the millennial reign for a thousand years. It's all in there, and it's all in order. Thus... Uh, shall Aaron come into the holy place? And how many of you have heard this story about how he, with these bells on his garments, and if he died, they'd have a rope around him and they'd pull him out? That's bogus. You know why? He didn't have any things with bells. He had the white linen garments on. He had to have the white linen garments on when he went into the most holy place. That's just a made-up story. Okay? Because he could never go, he could only go into the holiest of holies once a year, and he had to go in with the linen garments on, not his high priest garments. And no rope on the ankle. Sorry, guys. That's just the story you've heard. But we see here that Aaron will come into the holy place with the young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. And he shall put on the holy linen coat and have on the linen breeches upon his flesh. And he will be girded with a linen girdle and have on a linen mitre. Uh, these are holy garments. Therefore, he shall wash his flesh in water and so put them on. And he shall take the congregation of the children of Israel, two kids of the goats for a sin offering. The reason why I underline that, again, to show the Azazel was not Satan, because you have two goats, but it's called one offering. Uh, and one ram for a burnt offering. And what do we see? The member, they should afflict their souls. That's what it says on Yom Kippur. And what do we see about Isaiah 53 uh, concerning Yeshua? It says, surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and what? And afflicted. It was, you know, in memory of the day that he was afflicted, making atonement, which is why we fast now this next picture is kind of interesting in isaiah 118 god says come now let us reason together saith the lord though your sins be as scarlet they shall be as white as snow though they be red like crimson they shall be as wool so god wants to take the uh, the red and turn it to white that's gonna be very symbolic here you're gonna see in just a minute in jeremiah 2:22, it says for though you wash yourself with nitre and take much soap, yet your iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord God. The interesting thing is when you look at these Hebrew words, because the word wash in Hebrew literally means to trample by stamping with the feet, including the fulling process. Now, nitre, what is that? It, well, it's an acid. It's an acid. Now, how many, can you imagine throwing acid on yourself or something? Thinking that's going to get rid of your sin, throwing acid on it to try to get rid of it. But then it says, let's go to the other end. Let's take, um, uh, he says, soap. Well, this refers to alkaline. Well, if you know chemistry or anything, either extreme of an alkali or an acid is going to just destroy you. And God says, even if you take either one of those extremes, it's not going to help because your sin is marked before me. Well, the word marked there is, look at the picture, it's like an engraved in stone. Acid... Uh, alkali is not going to erase sins that are engraved in stone. And the problem is we're like a, a, a stone and our sins are etched. And the only thing that's going to get them out is going to be the blood of the Messiah. Do you see the two goats there? Think about this. It was so crucial for the nation of Israel that the high priest not be disqualified from performing his duties. How many times a year could they do this? If for some reason the, the high priest made a mistake, this would be a monumental national catastrophe. There are no do-overs. Well, as a safeguard, they made the high priest actually leave his house the week before Yom Kippur. And he would go into the temple, and there were quarters where he would go in and he would stay there. 
Well, what, there was about 500 priests that would assist him also. Uh, but they were concerned, so they also had an assistant that would also learn everything, so that if he did die, the assistant or the substitute could come in and take over. Uh, but because the high priest didn't always, you ever notice you have a boss who doesn't do any of the work? You know what I'm talking about? Well, the high priest was that way. So the high priest really never knew what was going on. So that whole week was in there. They made him go through the entire service so that he would learn it. The high priest was often appointed by Herod and achieved it through bribery or treachery. A lot of times they weren't even from the Levitical line. And so now you're dependent on this crook for your forgiveness as well. And so what the young priests would do, they, a lot of them didn't really care for the high priest because it was just a power thing. Uh, usually the Sadducees were the wealthy people of the area, and they were the ones that would be appointed to this. And so what, the night before, the high priest would have to stay up all night, and these young priests would be reading him scriptures and making him, quote, memorize portions of the scripture to make sure he knew it. And if he fell asleep, they would stand him up on the cold marble temple floor in his bare feet. And they do all kinds of things because they didn't like the idea that here, here's this guy or, you know, everything's in their hands. If, if the high priest blew it for some reason, let's say he died the day before, they're, they're in trouble. Uh, the other thing is this. They were dependent on someone else for their forgiveness as a nation. How would you like to be dependent on me if you were forgiven? That's the mindset. Think about this. Put yourself in the, as the nation of Israel. Their mindset is, if he doesn't do it right, I'm not forgiven. But you see how that sets them up with the mindset of the Messiah. Someone else, they are dependent upon someone else for their forgiveness. Uh, so anyway, during the Yom Kippur ceremony, there was these two goats. And one of the goats had a red, they were almost identical twins. So the way they told them apart, they would tie a red sash around one of the horns of the scapegoat, the Azazel. Then they would take another red sash and tie it around the temple doors. So picture that for a minute. Then the goat that is going to be taken out into the wilderness, for a long time they took it out into the wilderness, but guess what happened? It would be coming back. And they go, oh my goodness, here comes our sins. You know, for heaven's sake, we don't want them to go to the neighbors. And so what they decided to do, they took the goat out about 10 miles to the edge of a cliff and they threw him over backwards so he would die. So he died anyway because they didn't want him coming back. Well, historically, when you read the Talmud uh, uh, that records all the events that were happening during that time, every year, faithfully, when they did that, though, during Christ's time, the red sash on the temple door literally turned white. Based on that verse, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Prophetically, every year, that sash literally would turn white, and they would know that their sins were forgiven. That's how they knew. In the synagogues, everyone would come in white. Every Yom Kippur at sunset tomorrow night, if you go to a, any synagogue service, it's called the Kol Nidre and service, and they will all have white. Everything is white. Well, what's interesting, what does white speak of? <clears throat> the righteousness of the saints. And on that day, they've been atoned for. So they're, they're going through all this routine, not understanding really what's going to be happening. And you're going to see this in the book of Revelation, which is quite exciting as we're going through this. Now, here's the exciting thing, if you look at your notes here. In the Talmud, it relates four ominous events that took place 40 years before the temple's destruction. Now, what year did, was the temple destroyed? 70 AD. Subtract 40 years, what year is that? I wonder what happened about 30 AD. Messiah died. Now, the Talmud doesn't record that, but look at what they say. From 30 A.D. to 70 A.D., the lot for the Lord's goat would always come up in the left hand. The scarlet thread stopped turning white on the temple doors. The westernmost light on, in the temple menorah wouldn't stay lit. And the temple doors would just open up by themselves. Here's a, a, a normal door, and that's probably 12 foot. But look how big these doors were. It would take like 20 priests on each side to open those doors. They were so heavy. And yet the doors would all of a sudden start opening by themselves. 
all these ominous things happened. Well, the way the priests interpreted all these events, especially the opening of the doors, is Zechariah 11.1. 1, it says, open your doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour your cedars. And so they saw destruction was coming. Every year they just saw destruction was coming to the temple. And that's exactly what happened in 70 AD. Josephus records all kinds of other ominous events that took place the actual year that it was destroyed. I don't have time to go into that, though. So let's look at Leviticus 25, 9 through 10. It says, Then shall you cause the trumpet of Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. So look at that. How many of you have heard of the year of Jubilee? But do you realize that the Jubilee trumpet is only blown on the day of atonement? That's the, that is when it is blown. And it says, You shall howl the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land. See what you're supposed to do? Proclaim liberty. Isaiah prophesies, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to do what? To proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound. To proclaim what? The acceptable year of the Lord. Is he proclaiming the year of Jubilee? In his day, that's what he's doing. Well, what do we find in Luke 4? Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan... And how many days was he in the wilderness? Forty days. Hmm. And he was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And now let's look at Luke 4, 14 through 21. So Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him throughout the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And Yom Kippur is a Sabbath day, even if it falls on a Wednesday. And he stood up to read. And there was delivered to him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to... Preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. Now, if you remember last week, Yom Teruah is the opening of the book. Yom Kippur is the closing of the book. The opening of the gates. And now it's the closing of the book. And he says, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. This is telling you this event happened on Yom Kippur. Because you can only proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the year of Jubilee, on Yom Kippur. But it also tells you he begins his ministry in the year of Jubilee. What a great way to start your ministry. Now, what's interesting, you remember what they did with the goat on Yom Kippur? They took him to a cliff and tried to throw him over the cliff to kill him? Well, let's look what happens in Luke 4. Do you think they enjoyed his little sermon there? It says, all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill whereon the city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. It's like here he's the scapegoat on Yom Kippur. They're taking him to the cliff. They're trying to throw him off and kill him. Isn't that an interesting little picture scenario? But now what let's do, let's compare the book of Leviticus and the book of Revelation and see if we see a divine appointment happening and if it's the Yom Kippur service. I believe these events will happen some year on Yom Kippur. Leviticus 16, the next clip here. Talking about the high priest. You don't see he's all in white. And it says, and he shall take a censer full of burning coals. Notice this, burning coals of fire from off of the where? So here you have the, the high priest taking a fire, uh, a censer full of burning coals from a fire off the altar. And his hands are full of sweet incense beaten small, and they, he brings it within the veil. And then what does he do? It says, he shall put incense upon the fire before the Lord. Do you see that? That the cloud of the incense may cover what? The mercy seat, okay, that's sitting on the ark. That's upon the testimony that he died not. And then he takes the blood and he's sprinkling it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger how many times? Seven times. So he's sprinkling his blood. He's getting blood all over his garments. And he kills the goat of the sin offering. That's for the people. And he brings his blood within the veil. And he does that with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull. And he sprinkles it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And one of the interesting things I want to bring up here first is in Psalms 141, it says, let my prayer be set before you as what? So prayer and incense are equivalents, right? And the lifting up of my hands is the evening sacrifice, like the blood. Now in Revelation 6, 9, what do we have here? It says, when he opened the fifth seal, he sees where? 
under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, for the testimony which they've held. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, do you not judge and do what? Avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth. See, that's when vengeance is meted out on Yom Kippur. That's the, the, the day of judgment kind of is Yom Teruah, but then as the sentence is meted out on Yom Kippur. And now let's look at Revelation 8. Now look at this. We just got done reading about the high priest, what he's doing. Now let's look at what's going on in Revelation. There was an angel, came and stood at the altar. What did he have in his hand? A golden censer. And it was given unto him much what? That he should offer it with what? The prayers of the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended before God out of the angel's hand. Now remember in Leviticus, he had to take the fire from off the altar, didn't he? And what does it say here? The angel took the censer and filled it with what? Fire of the altar and cast it to the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquake. And how many angels were there? With how many trumpets? And how many times did he sprinkle his finger? Does it sound, do you see any similarity here at all? Let's look at Isaiah 63, verse 1 through 4. Do you see on that map there, that's Jordan next to Israel, and that's where Botsra is. Now, remember the, the high priest has on what kind of garments? And uh, do they have blood all over them? Let's look at Isaiah 63. Who is this that comes from Edom with dyed garments from Botsra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore are you red in your apparel? And your garments like him that treads the wine fat. I have tro trodden the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with me. I, for I will tread them in mine anger. I will trample them. Remember, means to wash, to trample. I will trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be what? Sprinkled upon my garments. I will stain all my remnant for the day of what? And what were they crying out for? Vengeance is in my heart. And what has come? The, the year of Jubilee. The year of my redeemed is come. Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. Do you notice the very last sentence there where it says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and it's underlined? That's where the Lord stopped in his day. Because the next phrase is to come, which is the day of vengeance of our God. So that is now in Revelation, now is the day of vengeance. So that's why there's multiple fulfillments. I was talking to you last week. You're going to see multiple fulfillments of a lot of these scriptures uh, that take place. And so uh, we're on Revelation 11, 15 through 19. And the nations were what? They were angry. And your wrath has come in the time of the dead that they should be what? Judged. This is Yom Kippur terminology. And that you should give rewards to your servants. So it's, it's good. Judgment is good for the good guys and bad for the bad guys. And it says, And to the saints, and them that fear your name, small and great, and should destroy them which do what? Destroy the earth. Now, how often do you go into the holiest of holies? Once a year, and it's on Yom Kippur. So only once a year do you see into the holy of holies. And what does it say? And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. That's a Yom Kippur. That's a day of Yom Kippur. That's why the, the heavens are open, and, and you're looking in, and you're seeing the ark of the testament. Now the top of page 7. Matthew 13, 38 and 39. You'll see in the picture there's a harvest, but this time it's the what harvest? Passover is the spring harvest, which is what? Barley. Pentecost, the summer harvest is wheat, and the fall harvest is fruit, and in particular the feast of, or the festival and harvest of grapes, the grape harvest. You're going to see grape terminology here. Matthew 13, 38 and 39, the field is what? It's the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, the tares are the children of the wicked one, the enemy that sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is what? The end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Now let's look at Exodus twenty three sixteen. What does it say? And the feast of what? That's referring here to Pentecost, the first fruits of your labors which you have sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering. That's this feast, the fruit, which is in when? The end of the year. The end of their year is going to be this month. When you've gathered in your labors, where? Out of the field. So it's a whole concept of harvesting. 
and it's uh, at the end of the year. Actually, this is the first month of the new year. Nowhere are you going to hear about a harvest of wheat or barley. It's a harvest of grape because these events are going to happen in that month as a rehearsal. Look at Revelation 14, 18. Another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of what? The vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe. So do you see the picture? Can you see? Now when you're seeing Revelation, you're beginning to see, just like the first time he came, the events literally took place in April, June. The Revelation, the end time events are going to happen in this month that we're entering in right now. <clears throat> Leviticus 16, verse 16 and 17. Uh, look at this one. It says, He shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And there shall be how many people? No one goes in the tabernacle except the high priest when he goes in to make an atonement in the holy place until he comes out and have made atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. So how many people could go in? Just one, just him. Now look at Revelation 15, 8. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And how many people was going to go in? No one's going to be able to go in the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels are fulfilled. That's a direct correlation to the Yom Kippur sacrifice. Now look at Revelation uh, 19. It says, true and righteous are his judgments, for he has judged the great whore. See, this is, it all refers to Yom Teruah to Yom Kippur. And it talks about uh, how she corrupted the earth with her fornication. And he has what? He has avenged the blood that had been crying out, the souls under the altar. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in what? Why? He just got done doing the heavenly Yom Kippur sacrifice. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were he uh, in heaven were followed him upon what? Clothed in what? That is what? And what do all the Jews wear every Yom Kippur service? White. And out of his mouth is going a sharp sword that he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with the rod of iron. You notice the nations here? Now he's dealing with nations, not just individuals. And what does he do? He treads the what? Which is made up of grapes. Of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. Do you see some kind of interesting, any similarities? In any of these things? Now, here's the most amazing thing. Prophetically, what it really is going to be standing for. What else is going to happen on this day? Many things are going to happen on these specific days. We don't know what years or if they're the same year or not. But look at this. This is how it's prophetic for the nation of Israel. Prophetically, on this day, this is the day that Israel, as a nation, will realize Yeshua is their Messiah. It'll be the national redemption of the nation of Israel. Won't that be exciting when all of a sudden that happens? <clears throat> yeah, 2 Corinthians 13, uh, chapter 3, verse 13 through 16. It talks about how Moses, he put a veil over his face like we were talking about, which happened when? You know, right at Yom Kippur, right before the Feast of Tabernacles, he has that veil that the children of Israel cannot steadfastly look at him to the end uh, of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded. For until this day remains the same veil untaken away in their reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, the veil is on their heart. Nevertheless, when the nation of Israel turns to the Lord, the veil will be taken away. This is a promise that the nation of Israel will turn to the Lord. There are so many prophecies that have never been fulfilled in the Bible. Everyone thinks they'll have all been fulfilled. Not. You're going to see quite a few here as we go. Now, what does an unveiled face speak of? An unveiled face is to see into the eternal purposes of God. Israel has yet to enter into their prophetic holy calling. As a matter of fact, a lot of people think, well, the Christians, they don't have a veil over their eyes, just the Jews do. But look what Isaiah 25 says, verse 7 and 8, that God's going to destroy in this mountain the face of the covering that is cast over who? And the veil that is spread over who? All, there's a veil, literally, that's right now over all of us. We only see through a glass darkly. And then it says he will swallow up death in victory. That refers to the return. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces and the rebuke of his people. That's referring to the Jewish people. He will take away from off the earth. And that hasn't happened yet. Now here's the thing. 
Most of the church today has a veil over their faces concerning the eternal plan that God has for the Jews. And the veil consists of two main parts. Number one is the church's inability to recognize God's purpose for the Jews. And secondly, the inability to understand the church's role for removing the veil that's on the Jews. Now here, God will remove the veil from both groups, but he's waiting for something significant to happen first. Yom Kippur was the only day the high priest could speak to God, what? Face-to-face is an idiom for Yom Kippur. When the Bible, you hear the term face-to-face, think Yom Kippur. And we see in Leviticus 16.2 that uh, the Lord told Moses, speak to Aaron that he doesn't come at all times into the holy place, which is within the veil before the mercy seat. Okay, you can only do that once a year. Leviticus 16.34, it says, it's an everlasting statute to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins. When? Many of you uh, in churches think that, by you, I just mean all Christians everywhere, think that all the sacrifices in the Old Testament were for sins. All those sacrifices they were doing every single day for thousands of years were uh, for thanksgiving offerings, for peace offerings. They had nothing to do with sin. But now look at this in Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 33 through 35. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out will I rule over you. And I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein you're scattered. So who's referring to? The Jews. And he says, with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out, I will bring you where? Into the wilderness of the people and there I will plead with you what? That is on Yom Kippur. This is a Yom Kippur event. The veil will be removed. And they will all as a nation enter into the Holy of Holies in one sense and realize that he is the Messiah. Zechariah 12.10, this next picture is kind of cool too. You can see the pierced hands of the Messiah, and it's a Yom Kippur. He's got us all white on. And Zechariah 12.10, it says, I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of New York. No. It says, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace, of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and they shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for their firstborn. So there's a day coming when they will look upon him whom they have pierced, and they'll realize he is the Messiah. In John 19, it says, again, there's another scripture that says, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. In Revelation 1, verse 7, it says, Behold, he comes with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Now, here's a phenomenal scripture you may not be familiar with. It just blows me away every time I read it. This is Hosea 5. Now, a day with the Lord is how long? A thousand years. So it was 4,000 years from Adam to Christ or four days. It's 2,000 years from Christ to now. This is 2005, give or take or whatever, the Hebrew calendar. So it's how many days has it been? Two days, right? Since Messiah. 2,000 years or two days. Now look at this, Hosea 5. It says, I'm going to go and return to my place. Is that not what the Lord did? He came, he died, he ascended, he went to heaven. He says, okay, I'm going to go and return to my place. And he says, he's not going to come back until when? Until they acknowledge their offense and seek my face in their affliction. And Yom Kippur is known as the day of affliction. They will seek me early. And what are they going to say? Come and let us return to the Lord for he has torn and he will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up. After how many days? In 1948, they became a nation. And then in the third day, the millennial reign, he will raise us up and we will live in his sight because he's ruling and reigning on earth. Right there's the prophecy of the third day, the third millennial reign. The rapture will all be raised up and we'll live in his sight. And then it says, then we will know if we follow on to know the Lord is going forth, it's prepared as the morning and he shall come to us as what? The rain. Remember last week, I talked about the rain, speaking of the blessings of God. And look at Matthew 23. This is what the Lord says. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that killed the prophets, stoned them which are sent to you. How often would I have gathered you as children together, even as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So what is he just saying? I am not going to come back and you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So if you want the Lord to come back, you need to be praying for the national redemption of Israel. And that's what believers should be doing on Yom Kippur. We've been atoned for 
we need to spend that day fasting and praying for Israel if you want the Lord to return, that they would begin to realize that he's their Messiah. Making sense? Look at Romans 11. Paul says, I would not, brethren, that you would be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit. Blindness in what? That's why Jews are still getting saved. It has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. There will be a national redemption for Israel. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant to them when I shall do what? Take away their sins. And when do you take away their sins? On Yom Kippur. And so and does, God, does God keep covenant? Why would anyone think he's done with Israel and has nothing to do with them? If he can break his covenant with Israel, he can break his covenant with you. There are promises to Israel that has not been fulfilled yet. And it says, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they're the election. They're the beloved of the, for the Father's sake. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. So he's, he's given them a calling, and what is that calling? We're going to look at that here. Romans 10, 1, Paul says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for Israel that they might be saved. He's not talking about one Jew. He's talking about the whole nation. Now, this is another mind-blower verse in Acts. You may have read a dozen times, but look at this. In Acts 3, the Lord has already died. He's rose again, and what else has he done? He's ascended to heaven. So where is he? He's in heaven. And look what Peter is saying here. And now, brethren, I know that through ignorance you did it, as did also your rulers, but those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. That part of it he's fulfilled. And then he says to the Jews that they need to do what? Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And then what does that next sentence say? And he shall what? He had already come, he'd already gone, he'd already ascended. He's saying he's not coming back until when? Until you repent as a nation. So he says, and then he'll send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must hold back until the time of the restitution of all things. So until Israel repents, the heavens are holding the Lord back. Does this seem pretty plain? Romans eleven fifteen. If the casting away of the Jews be the reconciling of the world, what is the receiving of them going to be? But look at this next picture. It says the rapture. It's life from the dead. If, if you want that to take place, what do you have to wait for? The national redemption of Israel. Jeremiah 31, I'll skip some, I won't read all of this, but Jeremiah 31, 31 through 36 is very important. This talks about the covenant with Israel. And it says, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I'm going to make a what? How many of you have heard of the new covenant? Who's the new covenant with? Is it with Gentiles? What does it say? The new covenant is going to be with the house of Israel and with who? We're grafted in. Too many churches think they're a separate covenant, a separate tree. It's, the, it's all one. We're grafted into that. It says, it's not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, uh, which covenant they break, I have underlined. Uh, let's drop down to the next underlined part. It says, this is going to be the covenant I'm going to make. I'm going to put my law where? In their inward parts. And I'm going to write it where? In their hearts. And will be their God and they shall be my people. And so before the law was on stone, now the laws are written on the hearts. Before we had to do it, now we get to do it, and we love to do it. And then it says, uh, uh, For they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Again, that sounds like an own, uh, Yom Kippur event. Thus saith the Lord. Now look at this. How many of you believe the sun is still here, and the moon, and the stars? It says, Thus saith the Lord, which gives the sun for light by day, the ordinance of the moon and the stars for light by night, which divides the sea when the waves are of war. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. If heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, then I will cast off the seed of Israel for all that they have done. And a guy that was working a booth across from me kept trying to figure us out. What are you? Are you Jewish? Are you Christians? What are you? You know, we're kind of like a bridge between the two, you know. But he came up to me and said, you know, you killed our Jesus. And I was like, oh, man, you are clueless, you know. 
But it's, it's like uh, they don't understand. God has a covenant with Israel, and it's not going to end. But here's the problem. Look at this next clip here. Genesis, 30, or Genesis 42, 8. Joseph knew his brethren, but they didn't know him. Why was that? Why didn't they know him? He was in, he dressed in Egyptian clothing, so they didn't recognize him. He looked, he smelled, and he dressed as an Egyptian. Okay. Since the days of the early church, it has been presenting the Lord to the Jew in pagan and Egyptian clothing. Yeshua is seen as a white, blonde European, uh, European far from his own roots. How is offering a pagan Jesus good news to the Jews? That's a heavy statement. I don't know if you guys really understand the ramifications. I'm not going to go into all the ramifications of that. But the church has been presenting a pagan Jesus, an Egyptian Jesus. They still haven't, we need to get the Egyptian clothes off, present a Jewish Messiah to the Jewish people. Genesis 37, 3 and 4, it talks about how Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children. Uh, but what did his brethren do? They hated him, right? And uh, I'm, what I'm going to do now is compare Joseph as a type of Messiah. Okay? In John 15, the Lord says, they hated me without a cause. Just like they hated Joseph, they hated the Lord. Genesis 37, 18, they saw Joseph afar off, and what did they want to do? Kill him. Matthew 26, 4, the Pharisees consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and do what? And kill him. Uh, Genesis 37, Judah said to his brethren, what prophet is... Now, who said this? Judah. Judah said, what prophet is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? So what, what, what do we need to do? Sell him. And what do we have in Matthew 26? They covenanted with him for how many? 30 pieces of silver. They sold him, the Lord. Zechariah 11 was a prophecy. I said to them, if you think it good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they wait for my price, what? 30 pieces of silver. That's the prophecy in Zechariah referring to this. Genesis 37, 23. Uh, they stripped Joseph out of his coat of many colors. What do we see in Matthew 27? They crucified the Lord, and what did they do? They stripped him of his garments and parted his garments. Genesis 39, we see uh, Joseph being falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. Was not the Lord falsely accused? Uh, Genesis 41, 38, Pharaoh said to his servants concerning Joseph, can we find anyone like this, in ma uh, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? Was that not true of Yeshua? Uh, Genesis 41, 55, uh, when the famine had happened, Pharaoh said to the Egyptians, go to Joseph, he'll tell you what to do. At the wedding at Cana, Mary said, go to Jesus. He'll tell you what to do. Uh, Genesis 42, 7 and 8. Joseph knew his brethren, but they didn't know him. Remember in John, he came unto his own. His own received did not. Uh, uh, Genesis 42, they said one to another. This is after they've been caught in Egypt. And they said, we are what? Very guilty concerning our brother. And Yeshua was their brother. It says, we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear. That's why this distress has come upon us. And in Genesis 43, verse 3 and 9, who was the one that sold Joseph? Judah. And what do we see here? Judah spoke to Jacob, trying to convince him. He says, the man did solemnly protest unto us, saying, you shall not what? Ah, oh, Yom Kippur. You shall not see my face. Except your brother is with you, and I will be surety for him. Of my hand shall you require him. And if I bring him not to you and set him before you, the, then let me bear the blame forever. So here there's Judah, the Jewish tribe. I will bear the blame forever. And they said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. Now, <clears throat> page 12, Genesis 44. But look at this. Who's speaking here? Judah. And Judah says, what shall we say unto my Lord, referring to Joseph, who is, you know, kind of interesting play on words. What shall we speak or how shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of his servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. He didn't know at the time Benjamin had it. And then what does it say? After he finds out it's Benjamin, now Judah is totally in torment. And he says, now therefore I pray you, let me Abide instead of the lad as a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father, and the lad be not with me? Lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my father. And in Genesis 45, what happened? When Judah repented, Joseph revealed himself. And when Judah repents, the Messiah will reveal himself. 
Joseph couldn't refrain himself, and the Lord won't be able to either once Israel as a nation repents. And he says, yes, this is the day I've been waiting for. And he's going to say, cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him. While Joseph made himself known to his brethren. And he wept aloud, yes, face to face. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am Yeshua. That's what he's going to say. They look upon me whom they have pierced. I am Joseph. Does my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were what? Don't you think the Jews are going to be troubled at his presence when he comes back and they realize what's happened the last 2,000 years? But look at what Joseph's response is, and this will be the Lord's response just as well. He says, come near, near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I, he's going to say, I am Yeshua, your brother, whom you sold. Now, therefore, don't be grieved, don't be angry with yourselves that you sold me hither, for God sent me before you to bring eternal life. For Christians, Yom Kippur is the day to rejoice. We've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, but it's also time for us to intercede for the nation of Israel that God would open their blind eyes to see who, there is, who is their Messiah. Exodus 12, 6, it talks about the lamb. Uh, this is referring to Passover, that the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Israel was commanded to kill the lamb. They were only doing what they were commanded to do when they offered the Lord up. As a matter of fact, Exodus 12, 21, it says you shall kill the Passover. Passover isn't a day. How can you kill a day? They were, to kill, they were commanded to kill the Passover lamb. In Exodus 12, 12 through 14, it says if they didn't, then they would be destroyed. And isn't that true? If Yeshua hadn't died, we'd all be destroyed. And he told Israel, you better kill that lamb or you're going to be destroyed. They had to. They were the elder brother. The Gentiles were the younger brother. The poor older brother had to do the responsibility. And aren't you glad that they had the responsibility to do what it was required and not us? Um, now, the interesting thing is the next feast is called the Feast of Tabernacles. And it's five days later, and it was also, we're going to talk about this next week as time is up, but it was also known as the Feast of the Nations. Now, why is that significant? I'm going to just touch on it briefly here, if you guys will give me a few more minutes. Genesis 10, 1 through 32 says this. Now, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were sons born after the flood. These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. In Genesis 10, you're going to see the nations, there were 70 nations that God divided. But if you'll notice, at, in Genesis 10, there is no Abraham yet. There's no Isaac, there's no Jacob. And yet, look at the top of page 13, our last page. In Deuteronomy 32, 8, it says, When the Most High divided the nations to their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of people according to what? The number of the children of Israel who hadn't even existed yet. And how many were there that he's talking about? The sons of Jacob. Exodus 1.5, it says, All the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were how many? And you find in Genesis 10, there were 70 nations. Now in Exodus 19.6, this was their calling, their mission. They were to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. They were to be the intercessors. God has not forsaken that covenant with them. That is why, look at this next verse, or next picture too. In Numbers 29, 13 through 32, during the Feast of Tabernacles, Israel would kill 70 bulls. You'll see there it says in uh, verse 2 and 13, it says, On the 15th day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation. That's a rehearsal. You shall do no servile work. You shall keep a feast to the Lord seven days, and you shall offer a burnt offering, a sacrifice made by fire of sweet savor to the God. Thirteen young bullocks is on the first day. The next day was 12, then 11, 10, 9, 8, 7. So over seven days, they slew 70 bulls. Why did they kill 70 bulls? On Yom Kippur, they were making atonement for themselves as a nation so that on Sukkot, they could make atonement for the nations. And what did the stupid nations do? Look at the next picture. They, the devil convinces them to destroy the very thing God is using to make atonement for them. If the Gentiles had known, they wouldn't have destroyed the temple. They'd have put armies around it to protect it. But the devil convinced them to destroy the very thing God was using to redeem them. 70 bulls for 70 nations. And so separating the sheep from goats. How many of you have heard of the separating of the sheep and the goats? How many of you have thought of that as individuals? You're a sheep, you're a goat. It's not. Look at it. In Matthew 25, 
It says, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered what? Nations, and he shall separate them one from another. As a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats, he's, there's going to be sheep nations and goat nations. And it's how those nations treated Israel, his brethren, what you've done to the least of these, my brethren. This is not individual, that's Passover. This is the day of the nations, which is why we as a nation got to be praying for a president. He does not go against God's covenant land. We see on Zechariah 14, 4, it says, His feet will stand in that day on the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will cleave in the midst toward the east and toward the west, and there'll be a very great valley. Has that happened yet? I don't think so. Half the mountain is going to move toward the north, and the other half it toward the south. So is that his return when his feet land on Mount Olives? Right? I mean, this is talking about his return. His feet are landing on the Mount of Olives. And look what it says it say. It shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the what? The nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to do what? To keep the feast of tabernacles. We're going to be keeping it every year for the thousand-year reign. It says, it'll be that whatever nation doesn't come up of all the families of the earth to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them there shall be what? And if the family of Egypt doesn't go up and comes not, they'll have no rain. And they also get the plague, wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to do what? Keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And this will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations which come not up to what? Keep the Feast of Tabernacles. These are things that are current that we're, we need to be understanding what's going on. The last verse is 3 John, verse 9 and 10. To give you an idea of how quickly the church, the Gentiles... I mean, some of you, if, if you don't have any understanding of the Hebrew... Uh, the Torah or whatever, to, to go teach it, you're not going to teach it, you don't know it, so you're going to come up with something else. Remember the Lord talked about the Gentiles, how they like to lord over the flock? To look how quickly the church turned. This is in 3 John, verse 9 and 10. Now, was John one of the closest to the Lord? Did the Lord love John? Did John love the Lord? Would you like to have John in your church? Look what it says here. John is writing to the Who? The church, but Diotrephes. Now, does that sound like a Jewish name or a Greek name? That's about as Greek as you can get. And the Greek meaning is lover of Zeus or friend of Zeus, as a matter of fact. And this is the pastor of a Christian church. And what does John say? He loves to have the preeminence. Isn't that like the Gentiles? Among them, he doesn't receive us. He's not allowing John or the Jews already in the church. This was happening that quickly. Then look what it says. Wherefore, John says, if I come, I'm going to remember his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words, and not content with that, look what else he does. He doesn't receive not only me, but none of the Jews. And not only that, he forbids them that would, and cast them out of the church. Any of the Gentiles that were already receiving Jews were being kicked out of the church. What I wanted to point out, though, is now there's the International Christian Embassy of Jerusalem, and that's their website I'd love to have you guys go to. You will see there are hundreds of thousands of Christians that are understanding the Feast of Tabernacles. And they're keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. They're going to Israel uh, during the Feast of Tabernacles. Some of them are staying here and they're living in... I'm going to be talking about Feast of Tabernacles next week. But it's www.icej.org. You're going to find out there are just millions of Christians worldwide that are now understanding the importance of the feasts. This is not just me. This, this is worldwide. And I'm just kind of introducing you, giving guys a taste of what is going on prophetically. God is moving in the body. He wants us to understand these things.